So uh, at, this, uh, at this point, um, I want to welcome Andrew Steer to the stage. Andrew is the CEO of the World Resources Institute, and we're going to be sitting right here, Andrew. And um, that's your mic, and I've got my own. So uh, before anything else, I need to get my little computer to kind of start talking to me again. But um, uh, Andrew, I'm really, really happy. First of all, uh, the, my favorite name in the world is Andrew. <laughs> so we had one of our uh, breakout panels today where three out of four of the members of the panel were, were named Andy or Andrew or Andrea or something like that. Um, I don't know how it gets better than that. I wasn't in that room, fortunately. Um, but what I'd like to do is uh, have a conversation with you uh, that kind of sums up what we've been doing here today and puts it into a, a global context. In, um, so I've got a few questions for you um, that you can help me out with. So first of all, what, what is your sense of the challenge that we're facing? There's this combination of, of the, the, the advancing impact of climate change along with rapid growth in population, economic growth, market demand for new buildings, as we heard early this morning with Ed. Uh, when Ed was talking about the massive, uh, the, the very rapid and massive increase in square footage that will be uh, required for buildings in the next 30 years, um, and a vastly expanded built environment. Are we crazy to think that we can either hold back the tide of climate cat catastrophe or even do something positive in the face of all these challenges? That's a hell of a question. It sure it? is. Yeah. It <laughs> Uh, are we crazy? Yes, um, and we need to be. Um, and I must say, uh, today is the mic how working? Totally inspiring. Oh, yeah. So you'll have to is. talk directly into um, the mic there. I was just standing over there with Andrew just now, looking across this room, total silence. Everyone had their heads down, writing, and I said, you know, this could have been a Billy Graham crusade. <laughs> this is this is commitment, and that's what we need, actually. At the end of the day, this is an issue of the heart. Um, every revolution has to start like that, and I commend you for, uh, for doing that. Um, I really do, and Andrew, thank you. Um, and, and when you had that little breakout group uh, about uh, you know, 20 minutes ago, when you said, talk to someone you haven't spoken to, you know, I'm British, so I don't speak to people that haven't introduced themselves. Um, Jonathan from Facebook, where are you? Uh, he, he came up to me and he said, I want to talk to you. You're, you're wearing a suit and a tie. You clearly don't belong here. I need, I need to talk to you. Where are you? Where is he? And it was, so, it, was a, it was really uplifting when I said, what is the thing about today that's most exciting? He said, I don't know where to begin. But he said, learning about the integration, the Internet of Things, how, how buildings and, and, and utilities talk to each other. You know, and you just got this incredible sense of progress within this community. And what we need to talk about is how do we go from this mm -hmm. to real change? We have a massive problem on our hands. We cannot overstate the challenges that exist. And buildings, <laughs> the built environment is at the heart of it. Uh, and uh, as you know, one quarter of uh, greenhouse gases, one third of energy use, you could say, well, that's not very much. Here's the problem, and we've discussed it today. Um, yes, we're doing great. Every single year we have 1.5% improvement in energy productivity in buildings but 2.3% growth in floor space. So we are losing the battle. We're going in the wrong direction despite brilliant performance of people in this room uh, and around the world. And whilst today it's 25% of, of greenhouse gases, by 2060 it will be 65% of greenhouse gases if the others go in the direction they are. So we are positioning ourselves, you know, heading in the wrong direction, but because of what we're doing today now, uh, we, we could become one of the major, major sources of progress. You think about, you know, when I was born, there were a billion people living in cities. When I will die, <laughs> I have no idea when that will be, there will be between five and six billion. One billion to six billion in the space of a human lifetime. Never before has there been that degree 
of demographic or social change. No wonder then that three billion people in the world will need new homes by 2030. I mean, it's incredible, the challenge. Incredible. So what are we gonna yeah. do about it, Andrew? Oh yeah, well, let's start right there, <laughs> I think. So, you know, when I, when I look at the WRI mission, for example, it says, uh, I, I pulled this directly from your website, so you're responsible wow. for whatever it says. And it says, turning big ideas into action at the nexus of environment, economic, economic opportunity, and human well-being. And I'm thinking, you know, that serves as a pretty broad context, uh, ideally suited to what we're intending to come out of Carbon Smart Building Day. Yeah. And so my question, one question that I have for you is, what, what, what role do buildings, uh, you come to this um, event and from your work at, at WRI from a very broad global context. So it's not only about, about buildings, quite obviously, but what role do buildings and the people who design and build and invest and own and regulate them, uh, the people who are well represented in this room here today, what role do buildings and, and the people here play in that movement? Well, they, they play a, a, a central role. Um, here's the issue. Each individual person or firm, you know, or profession could be doing the right thing. And still, it may not add up to a solution. And, and what we need to talk about now is how do you get the whole to add up to more than the sum of the part? How do you create that tipping point? I mean, just in the last two hours, we've heard a lot about the revolution that needs to happen. That's exactly the right, the movement that needs to happen. And we spend a lot of time, and you probably do too, thinking about what is it that's, that triggers a positive tipping point? And there are lots of them. I mean, why was maternal mortality going nowhere? It was one and a half million women dying in childbirth every year for 50 years. And then suddenly, in less than 10 years, it fell by half. What causes that? What causes, you know, 95% of politicians to think that same-sex marriage is a bad idea and six years later, 80% to think it's a good idea. How do you get that kind of change? How do you get, you know, it took the United States here 18 years to phase out lead in gasoline. When I lived in Vietnam, they did it overnight. And in, that, in the space of 10 years after the United States leadership, you had 150 countries phasing out lead. You got that sort of absolute unstoppable progress. What is it that causes that? And we spend a lot of time thinking right, about right. what causes it. And some of the things are pretty obvious. You need, um, you need a very clear and sticky message. And do we? I, I, think, I think we can have that. And, and by the way, if you ask the question, why has climate change actually risen whilst biodiversity has declined on the international agenda? is because biodiversity hasn't had that sticky message. There's no two degrees. So too, why is adaptation very much the poor sister of mitigation? Is because it hasn't had that narrative. It hasn't got that sticky message. You need the sticky message, you then need the powerful messenger. Uh, you need the right leadership, and here's the really important point. You need a coalition of peers, usually multi-stakeholder, who talk to each other, that look at each other, that say, my word, she's doing that, it's helping her political career, I want to do the same. And as you look at almost every revolution that's taken place, you see that. And in our, in our space at the moment, you see it in certain areas. For example, sort of the global or the national leadership, let's say, of uh, Prime Minister Modi on renewable energy came into office um, and he said, uh, no, I don't just want to go to 20 gigawatts of solar by 2020. I want to go to 100 gigawatts by 2022. And everybody said it's impossible. That would be the biggest increase in solar in the history of the world. Now, what was he doing? He was actually being incredibly smart about human psychology and corporate behavior. He was saying, this is not incremental change. Yeah, right. He was saying, this right. is disruptive change. This is an entirely new industry. There's going to be thousands of factories. There's going to be new institutes of technology. There's going to be massive financial transformation. Get ready for it. And what's happened? <laughs> They're on track. It's unbelievable. We never expected them to be. Now, I don't know if they'll achieve it, but even if they achieved two-thirds of it, it would be amazing. amazing. That's the kind of leadership. Who's that leader for us today? As of today, only 35% right. of the countries right. have mandatory energy efficiency right. standards right. In, 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 in their buildings and so on. Yeah. So how do we, how do we get that right. kind of 
Um, and, you know, you look, for example, at, um, uh, you know, if you look at the clearly obvious things that we should do, one's building efficiency, one is landscape restoration. It was going nowhere um, until the Africa Union, with our help and others, put together something called Africa 100, 100 million hectares by 2030, and suddenly we have 20 countries in Africa committing to 85 million already hectares, money starting to, to flow in. Why? Because you had that kind of political leadership. This suddenly became right. a hot topic, right. and it had a narrative that was so beautiful. It was taking carbon up in the air where it's killing people, bringing it back down to earth to restore the land in the form of soils and crops and trees and bushes, where instead of bringing death, it brings life, it brings resilience, it brings food security. You know, fabulous right. narrative. Right. What's our narrative? And how do we get that kind of momentum going? Well, it strikes me that the history of humanity is it's essentially a history of long periods of relative inaction or relative stability or relative static behavior on the part of large numbers of people, and then very brief periods of very radically yes. different behavior in, in which massive change actually takes place. And it makes remember, me remember a book I read year, years ago by a uh, Harvard uh, evolutionary biologist named Stephen Jay Goulding, in which he talked about something he called punctuated equilibrium. It was about how in the history of the world, species over many, many, uh, not just decades, hundreds of years, thousands of years, uh, millions of years in some cases, remain relatively stable and steady as a species, and then overnight, suddenly, you know, they're, they're a lot bigger, they have different colors, or they live in a different part of the world. So what we're talking about is literally a revolution in human behavior, and in the building industry, it's about a revolution in behavior as well. So one of the things that uh, we've been talking about a lot today, uh, beginning with uh, the first minute of the day, was some, a, a thought or an idea called collective impact. So a collective impact initiative, um, a way to, to bring together a collaboration of many different players, many different partners, a very, very highly diverse movement to make change. Could you talk a little bit about, well, from your perspective, what is collective impact? What does it mean uh, to create a collective impact initiative? How would collective impact allow us to go further, faster, and together than we can do by ourselves? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, and, and your point about punctuated equilibrium, I mean, how important that is. And the lesson for us is not that we can necessarily create that, 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 that point in time, although we can certainly try, we need to be ready for it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> in other words, yeah. there may well be a time yeah. two years from now when suddenly in this country, we get an opportunity. Right. We need to be ready for and it. And you don't know when and it is. You don't know when yeah. it is, so you yeah. jolly well better be <laughs> good. Could yeah. he, he say yeah. that? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So, so your, your point about sort of collective action, um, there, there's a great book which I know you've read. I have. Uh, because I read it because you made me read it. <laughs> I did. Well, I actually made, yeah. I, I gave it to all of our managers because I said you, you should read you it because this captures it. It's called, the, um, it's called the, the Tower and the Square by, by uh, Neil Ferguson, you made. And basically, it's about how decisions get made through history. It's a history book. Right, right. And it basically says through most of history, we get the impression that it's sort of vertical because history is written by kings and successful people. But also, in most parts of history, it's, you know, governments that sort of say, this is what you'll do, and the serfs or whoever do it, and so on. But he said the really interesting thing is the square. That's the tower. The square is actually networks. Networks, it's the horizontal, if you like. And, and, um, and he said there are two great periods of horizontal, um, and, uh, the, the, and basically they were sort of, the, the, the period of uh, the Reformation, where suddenly you got a Martin Luther, you then had the printing press, you had a sort of, if you like, democratization of decision-making and power. And then, but a, but a much bigger one is, yeah. is basically from 1970 to today. He said radically different. As a historian, as a political analyst, he said, you know, we now are making decisions differently. And that is so true. Yes, governments are central. I mean, they're very important. The best times in history for the best is when multi-stakeholder coalitions engage with governments. And, and it, again, in, in, in some of the areas we work in, let's say deforestation in Southeast Asia. 
Why is it caused? 80% caused by palm oil. Palm oil is much cheaper to chop down the forests, sell the wood, use the money to build palm oil mills, send it to you and me. So here's the point. Half of all the goods in a supermarket here have palm oil in them. So you start getting the notion of what a network, what a group yeah. of stakeholders could look like, starting with those that buy it, going all the way through the supermarkets, going to the producers, going to the traders, going all the way down to both the large estates and then the smallholders. Who do you need in a room? You need all of those people, plus you need the Minister of Finance from Indonesia and Malaysia, you need, and so on. So you, get, you need the Smallholders Association. That is now, it's now happening, for example. There's something called the Tropical Forest Alliance, where you know, at Davos each year, you get actually the, the coordinating minister from Indonesia. You get you got the whole lot, and then you get the good guys. And then organizations like us, we provide the satellite monitoring so we can see basically every tree that's falling. So we can actually now say, actually, if you buy from that palm oil mill, there's a 60% chance that it was dishonorably harvested. That's an example yeah. of the kind of... Now, so, so that for us in this space, how could we put that together, so right. we get the equivalent of the Indonesian Minister of Finance or whoever, plus we get the CEO of, right. you know, IKEA, plus right. we get, do you know what I mean? Well, so if you think about the building industry as, a, as an organism, as a single uh, global organism, that organism needs a biofeedback function. It needs a way to understand what's the impact of what we're doing, what are we aiming at, what's the vision that we need to, to get to. And then what's the theory of change that we have that will enable us to get there? And finally, what are we doing together today that will have a practical, measurable impact, impact on that? So, Great. Yeah. I wish I could have said that. That was, that no, was perfect. No, you did say it. I'm just quoting <laughs> you. So, good. so, Andrew, thank you so much. It's been fantastic. Well, thank you, Andrew. You I, I, think, um, I think we should give Andrew a round of applause for a really stunningly good day. Thank you very much. Thank you.